Hello, New Community Church Online. Great to be with you today. My name is Pastor Rob, and we are set to start a new series today on doubt. And I hope that you lean in for this, not only today, but for the next four weeks. We, we really think this is an important topic. We, we talked about it uh, months ago when we put it on the calendar just because of all that's been going on. <clears throat> I saw a lot of people who were struggling with doubt. The doubt, honestly, it started sort of loose in the very beginning, uh, a year, year and a half ago. It was like, I, I doubt that this pandemic will be a big deal. You remember those days? I, I doubt that COVID will last more than a few weeks. I remember thinking that. I doubt it will shut down church. I doubt it will shut down church for very long. But those doubts became realities and then it became uh, skepticism. I, I remember hearing a lot of people say, I doubt the government has our best interest at heart. I doubt that masks really work. I doubt maybe someone doubts that the vaccines really work and, and on and on these doubts went during that stage. But then it became more serious. As we all know, I heard, I doubt I'm going to get through this. I doubt my business is going to make it. I doubt that our family is going to hold up financially. I doubt that my marriage is going to make it. I, I doubt that I'm going to make it. <clears throat> and then some, ultimately, where is God in all of this? I, I doubt that he is with me. I, I doubt his promises. I doubt him, that he's real. And maybe you've had some of those doubts, maybe related directly to the pandemic or anything else we've been through, or maybe just normal, natural doubts that you've had during uh, the recent past. To make matters worse, uh, we put another log on the fire with racial discord, especially right here in our local community. And it became very intense, as you know, still is. And that became uh, very, very difficult. We had um, a lot of political unrest and people fighting and infighting, even within the church, about politics. And then this week, why not? Another log in the fire of a pipeline got hacked in the southeast and we're all out of gas. I, I think that'll resolve shortly. I pray that it does, and I hope that your home is safe and unaffected. But all of these things bring more and more tension, stress, and doubts. So today we want to tackle this big topic, and I want to point us to someone who had doubts also. And his name is John the Baptist, an amazing figure of the faith, as we all probably know. And I want to read a short text with you right now to, 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 to tell you about a time when John the Baptist had doubts too. And this will hopefully ha have you feel a little bit better, but my ultimate goal isn't just that you feel good, he had doubts too, but is that we know what to do with our doubts and we know how to handle them when they come. So that's where we're going today and really throughout this whole series. And if you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 to 6, this is the short text that I want to read uh, that, that deals with John the Baptist and his doubt. Matthew 11, 2 to 6, and, and this is what it says. When John, of course, we're talking about John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, Jesus, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. That's what Jesus said to him. This is a short text, but it's stock full of truths. And I, I observed four truths about doubt here, and I want to talk about them. And again, I hope this is an encouragement to each of you, whether you're doubting right now or not, because doubts are going to come. Uh, the first truth is this. Everybody has doubts. Everybody has doubts. And if you're taking notes, underline that one, because that it, this is so important that we realize that when you have doubts, you don't feel like everybody has doubts. You think I'm the only one and you, you feel weak and you feel disturbed about it, especially if you're a believer and if you're a Christian, and when you have doubts, it can make make you do all kinds of things, bad things, turn away from your faith and, and walk away for a little while or a long while before you come back. And that's very human. But when we realize that everybody has doubts and doubts are going to come and go, it, it can help us to get over that hurdle. John the Baptist in this text had doubts. And I want you to remind you 
who John the Baptist was. This wasn't just any old person, any old Christian. This is one of the greats of the Christian faith. John the Baptist had a prophecy about him 700 years before the text that I just read in Isaiah 40. It was prophesied that John would come and specifically what his purpose on earth was to do. His purpose on earth, of course, was to prepare the way of the Lord. He was to announce Jesus' coming. He was to let everybody know this is the Messiah. That was his really his one big job on earth, and a tremendous job it was. Um, not too many people have a prophecy about their birth, and certainly not 700 years before they come. Jesus was one that did. Of course, he had many prophecies about his birth, and John was another. But there's not too many. It's a very, very short and exclusive list. That's who John was. This is, this, this is a big-time uh, person in the faith. Not only that, but his birth was miraculous. And again, there weren't too many people who had a miraculous birth. Jesus was one. John the Baptist happened to be another one. His parents, you may remember, were elderly, and it's the text in the Bible says that they were unable to have children, but God blessed them with children. And then on top of that, he proclaimed to John the Baptist's parents that they were going to have this baby. And he came to them through the angel Gabriel. So an angel actually came and spoke to John's parents, told them this is what's going to happen, and this is who he's going to be and why it's so significant. So we're talking about, again, someone very, very important to faith, to the preparation of the Messiah, Jesus, coming to earth to save us, and and all that that entails. And he became a prophet himself. He, in fact, was the first prophet on earth since Malachi. There was a 400-plus year gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And John is the one just prior to Jesus that bridges that gap. God had went silent on the people and had not spoken through a prophet until John the Baptist came. And he spoke very powerfully. He was a messenger from God. He was a great evangelist. We could go on and on. You can get the point. Now, if you're thinking about yourself, um, you may be a wonderful person, and you probably are, and you're probably even a wonderful Christian person, but most of us would not compare ourselves to John the Baptist. I know I would not. I did not have a prophecy at my birth. I, I did not have an angel talk to my parents. I did not have a miraculous birth. I wasn't a great prophet. Uh, none of those things. doesn't mean that God hasn't used me, but it doesn't compare. So when I think of my faith, John the Baptist way up here. I'm way down here. And you, you might say the same thing. So it's very, very important that this is the person that we see in our text that had a serious doubt in his faith. When we fast forward, John finally does get to fulfill his destiny, his purpose in life, to prepare the way of the Lord. He's been talking about Jesus, telling everybody about Jesus. He's coming, he's coming. And then Jesus comes to earth, God's son, sent to earth to save us. And here's what happens, John 1, 29. It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is a powerful passage because this is John the Baptist doing what he was called to do. But it also shows his tremendous faith. He knew without a doubt this was Jesus. He knew it. God told him. He spoke to his spirit. He, he could see it. He just knew it. His bones knew it. He, he proclaimed it. He had so much faith, and he helped so many other people have faith. So when we move on from this text and we get to Matthew 11, we're now in a different circumstance. John has had some tough uh, things happen to his life. We see that he's now in prison. He is being persecuted for his faith, and things are not going very well. When we read there in Matthew 11:3, his doubt, his question. Now we fast forward sometime later, and he's sending his his disciples to Jesus because he's in prison. He's saying, go ask him. And of course, the question, are you the one? Are you really the one uh, that I just got done saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He knew he was the one. And now he has a serious doubt. Does that mean John isn't a Christian? Well, no, he, he's one of the foremost Christians, one of the first Christians. Does it mean he's a bad person? Well, no, he's not a bad person. Does it mean that he is sinning very badly? Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but at face value, no, it doesn't seem so. He's asking a very valid question. He has a very valid doubt. And 
he goes straight to the source to find out the information. He asked Jesus himself. If you understand that even someone like John the Baptist has doubts, serious doubts from time to time throughout life, then you will be better off in your own Christian walk to be prepared for your own doubts. If you think that you're not going to have any doubts, you're going to be in trouble. I, I know that I grew up uh, originally in a church tradition, uh, like most people, where doubts were were a sin in and of themselves. That Doubts are something that you don't talk about. And the problem with that is when you take your doubt and you just stuff it down and you don't talk about it and you don't ask anyone, it, it grows past doubt into unbelief. And unbelief, of course, can take many different forms, like falling away from your faith. And so you don't want to do that. You want to understand that doubt itself doesn't have to be sinful. It can be something that drives us to ask hard questions and drives us into our faith, uh, as we'll talk about today. So that's the first truth. Everybody doubts. The second one is this. We doubt specifically when things don't go our own way. We doubt God when things don't go the way we think they should go. That's precisely what happened with John the Baptist. We see it in the passage in chapter two chapter 11, verse 2, we see that he's in prison, and I talked about that, and he's in prison because he had the gall to stand up against King Herod. Not too many people would do that. Herod was a, a ruthless person. And not only that, but he, he spoke against his immorality and, and his, his wickedness, and his wife became very incensed, and she went after John the Baptist. She took it very personally, as you can understand, and she had the power to make his life miserable, which she did. She started persecuting him. She had him thrown into, into jail. She had it out for him. And not only that, but ultimately, she had him beheaded. And he died as a martyr for his faith. And that's how big his faith was again. So his life had went from really good and really purposeful to not very good, even though he knew it was for the cause of Christ. So his circumstances changed. He had to have been thinking, oh, this isn't what I signed up for. He had to have been wondering on his dark days as he sat in an ancient first century biblical times jail cell. He had to have been thinking, where's God? Now, we're not told that explicitly, but I think you can draw the lines there. Also, his question that he asked Jesus, or, um, part of it we see in verse 2 is because he, quote, heard about the deeds of the Messiah. So we see he's in prison, but then we also see that part of his question comes out of this idea that he's heard about the deeds of the Messiah. So what's that What's that about? Well, in Jesus' day, many of the people who were theologically trained, the religious people, including John the Baptist, many of them had a belief about what the Messiah was to be. And they, they were taught, and probably John was too, they were taught that the Messiah was to be a political ruler. He was coming to make heaven on earth. They, they believed really what the second coming of Jesus is going to be was, was what's gonna, what was supposed to happen in the first coming. They, they didn't know. And they believed that Jesus were gonna, was going to overthrow the Roman government and raise up the Jewish nation, again, sort of a heaven on earth, and make them back into his people the way he had in the past. So when Jesus starts preaching something that he wasn't expecting, and when Jesus starts talking about, well, he's going to die on the cross, and he starts hinting that he's going to give his life away, and he's going to be a spiritually suffering Messiah, which, of course, is what the Bible had prophesied that he would, would be, John may have had some doubts about that. And that's why he, he's wondering about the deeds of the Messiah. Probably that's what's going on there. When God doesn't act the way I think he should act, I doubt. And that, I believe, is exactly what happens to John. When his circumstances change and they're not going the way he wants them to go, who wants to be in prison? I know I don't. <laughs> who wants to misunderstand who God is? I know I don't. And so when God doesn't line up with your idea of God or your idea of what God should do, we doubt. You doubt. That's very, very human. And I think it's really important that we understand that. Author Wade 
Bearden, he wrote a book about doubt a few years ago, and he said there's three different kinds of doubt. And I, I thought this was help, helpful to parse this out. And maybe you could think about this for yourself. Uh, have you struggled with one of these? Usually people fall into one of these three categories. And he said there, there's these three kinds, intellectual doubt, emotional doubt, and moral doubt. Intellectual doubt is when you doubt, obviously, at an intellectual level, the claims of Christianity. This is the person who reads through parts of the Bible. Maybe they don't understand those parts or, or they misunderstand them. And they start to doubt Christianity. They might be someone who doubts miracles. So well, I, I doubt that's what happened. They might look at the creation account of Genesis and say, well, I can't believe that. It doesn't seem like what science teaches. Therefore, I doubt all of Christianity. And, and many people have intellectual doubts. Emotional doubt, though, he says is different. And I agree with this, that emotional doubt is I don't feel right about God. And I, I think that might have been what was happening with John the Baptist, probably because he's in prison. His circumstances were bad. He wasn't sure about the deeds of the Messiah, it says. And so he has this sort of emotional doubt. He, he didn't have an intellectual doubt, I don't think. But he doubts based on his feelings. This doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like what I think God should do. So people today, I, I hear a, a lot about this in our Alpha course, and it, it's very common doubt and understandable doubt that people express with sincerity, which is, uh, why did bad things happen to my friend, my, this good person? Why did, why did a bad thing happen to me? Why, why did a bad thing happen to my loved one? Why did I lose someone I love? Why, why did um, I lose this relationship? Or why did this bad tragedy happen to these really good people? Those are honest and difficult questions, and they raise doubts. That's an emotional doubt. It hurts, and I want God to, to heal that hurt, but I don't know what to do with it. And if you're in that camp, uh, first of all, please know that you're not alone. It's a very big camp, probably the biggest of these three, but also know, and you can see it through John, there's something you can do with that doubt, and we'll, again, we're going to keep going toward that today. And then the third one is moral doubt. Moral doubt's a bit different. Moral doubt is, is tied to sin, and when I understand sin properly according to the Bible, I realize that it creates a great chasm between me and God, my creator. And of course, Jesus Christ, God's son, came to bridge that chasm. He came and died on the cross to give me a way to get to God, to have all my sins taken care of so that God could receive me and I could have a relationship with the Father. Hallelujah. So great. And I hope that you have that relationship with God. And I hope that you take a step toward it today in faith by praying to God and asking him to be your savior and your Lord. But what happens is, uh, even as a Christian, I can start to have failure, moral failure. And the moral failure can get the better of me. And if I'm not careful, I will start to doubt Christianity because the sin is in my life and God promised victory and I'm not having victory. Or I start to disagree with God and say, well, this sin isn't really a sin. And of course, I believe the devil's behind that. He tries to trick us. This sin, the Bible says it's a sin, but our culture says it isn't. In fact, our culture celebrates it. So which is right and which is wrong? And I start to believe culture or my own heart over what God has said. That, that's a moral doubt. I, I start to doubt, in a sense, I'm doubting God's morality. And I'm starting to believe that my morality has a better understanding of right and wrong than God does. And of course, that, that was the devil's trick from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden when he tried to convince Adam and Eve to eat the fruit. And he, he did God really say that this is, this is wrong? You know, that was his first question, his first temptation. He's been trying to get us to think that our morality is better than God's since the beginning of time. And so we got to be careful because these moral doubts slip in. A number of big-time Christians in the past several years have fallen away from faith, and they've said, I'm no longer a Christian. A, 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 a staggering number, actually. And I was looking up some of them for this sermon. I was thinking about some of their cases. And one thing I observed is a lot of those Christians had this third category. They had moral doubt. They heard the world's teaching about a particular area that the Bible called sin. Usually it was in the area of sexuality. And they agreed with the world, and they said, therefore, I can no longer be a Christian. And so that's a real thing, and it's a way that we can be taken away from our faith. And if you're struggling with that, I, I think there's uh, 
a, a way to deal with it by being honest about it, by talking to people about it, by studying the word, by praying about it. Uh, you can come to talk to me about it if you want to. And there are ways to, to, to get through that kind of doubt and work through that kind of doubt so it just doesn't take you completely out of your faith. Uh, but these are the ones that we need to look for. I was thinking about it this way. I think, I don't know if, I hope this is a helpful illustration that, that I had come up with. My son Micah uh, is studying computer science with an emphasis on game design. And I was thinking about a game designer and, and the process of designing games. Of course, I've never done that myself. I've played computer games. I enjoy them, but I, I'm, I'm not smart enough to know how to, 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 to design one. But every game has a designer, usually multiple designer, but there's usually one main designer over the game. And let's imagine that this, this designer, like many games, has design, designed this complete fantasy world. And of course, he wants to take you into this sort of fun experience in this world. And, and the next thing the designer does after they make this world, this fantasy world, is they create all these fun characters and they put them in the world to do certain things. The game designer then comes up with all the parameters of the game and, and codes them in with zeros and ones, you know, and allows this game to be experienced by the user. And the characters have different functions. They have things they're supposed to do. And ultimately, the, the game is to achieve some end. It might be that you win at the end or you get to a certain level or you get to a high score or whatever it is to achieve victory. But now imagine this. The characters in the game become conscious. And again, this is how my mind works. I hope this is a helpful illustration. Imagine if that were possible. They become conscious of their own selves like a human does. And they realize they're in this game, but they don't like it and they don't like the parameters of the game. And they start fussing about it between themselves. Well, I, I don't like this game. I don't, I don't think it's fair that I have to stick to the script, that I have to do this a certain way. I don't, I don't like the end game. I don't, I, don't, I don't like anything about this. I wanna get out of this game. I don't know, Pac-Man, if he decided one day that he didn't like the little maze that the game designer gave him that he had to stay in, I wanna transcend that maze. I wanna get out of this thing. I don't like it. Well, if that were possible, he would start to doubt a few things. He would start to doubt the game itself. Is this a worthy game? He would start to, to, to question his role in the game, whether he really likes it. He would he'd be very dissatisfied. He or she would start to doubt the designer, and they would start to question the designer. Now, they question the designer on two levels. Does the designer really care about us, that he made the game like this? And secondly, close second, is he real? Is there really a game designer? Maybe this was all by chance that we were put here. So if you could see it through the eyes of a simple game, you might say, well, that's absurd. Of course there's a game designer. No one could make something that complex. No, no one could put something with those parameters in place and just happen by chance. Of course not. But now we're talking about life. And, and life is way more complicated than a game design or a game designer. And we're talking about God, a creator. who, And we're talking about someone who loves us. They didn't just put us in and, and, and arbitrarily put parameters. He put us in and gave good, loving parameters and taught us what they are through the scripture and showed us in his person of Jesus Christ. And, and then he allows for doubt. He allows us to question him. It happens all the time. The most godly people in the Bible, from Job to John the Baptist, they questioned God and God lovingly walked them through it. Which leads me to the third truth. Jesus never rebukes John for his doubt. That's really important. Um, so like the game designer in that illustration, when the characters of the game come to life and start questioning, is it, you know, what, what are you doing up there? Are you real? Do you really care about us? Jesus is like that game designer who lovingly helps them to see the way to achieve victory. He himself, of course, in the biblical view, comes down and becomes a part of our world. In, in the illustration, he would actually come into the game so that he could walk us through to achieve that victory and ultimately transcend the game, which we call eternal life. Now, that illustration will fall short. But what doesn't fall short is that God loves us and he allows for our weaknesses. He understands them. He doesn't uh, necessarily always want us to have them. And some of them are sinful, but he will have patience and grace to walk us through. So John the Baptist is 
embraced by Jesus. And what does Jesus do specifically back to our text, verses 4 and 5? Jesus replied, this is what I want you to tell to John. Go back and tell him what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. So he answers John's doubt. And he says, look, I want you not to focus on what you don't understand. I don't want you to focus on, implied here is I don't want you to focus on your circumstances that you're in prison. What I want you to focus on is what you can actually see, what God is actually doing. And look what God is doing. He is doing miracles. He is having deaf people hear. He is having lame people walk. He is having the good news spread. All kinds of activity was buzzing around Jesus. And I'm sure when John got this news back from his disciples, he was thrilled because he did have faith. His doubt wanted proof, but he got it. And he knew it all along, but he just wanted some confirmation. He wanted some affirmation. And Jesus gave it to him in the form of this answer. Look at what's happening. Look at what God's doing. And if you're doubting, I would send you to the same place. First of all, go to Jesus with your doubt. That's what John does. And leave it there. He can take it. God has broad shoulders. And then let him, let him answer the doubt. Don't just leave yourself in the doubt. Let God show you what he's doing in this world. Look around. You see only the darkness, but look at what God's doing. Look at how Christianity is thriving after thousands of years. Look at how his church is on the move. Look at what uh, he's doing through his people to help serve the community, to serve the poor, to love each other, to, to live out the one another. Just look at what God's doing. And you will start to say, yes, yes, I know he's real and I know he's true. I, kn I know that he loves me. And I'm going to go one step further because just a, first, just a few verses later, Jesus takes it up a notch. He, just, he doesn't just not rebuke John for his doubt. He doesn't say, shame on you, John. You shouldn't be doubting. You know, you of all people, the one that really was my forerunner. He doesn't say that. But he goes a step further. And in verse 11, he says this, truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Whoa, 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 wait a minute now. The one who just came to you with a very serious doubt, you're going to say is the greatest among all of the people of the world? Yes, that's exactly what Jesus says about John. Among those who are living, he is the greatest. And the doubt doesn't stop Jesus from saying that. In fact, I think it's part of it because John took his doubt and went to Jesus Christ with it, which is truth number four. Doubts can lead you closer to Christ if you want them to. The doubt itself is neither sinful nor unsinful. What is sinful is what do we do when that doubt comes in? The doubt came from some exterior place. It might be intellectual, it might be moral, uh, it might be emotional. And when it comes in, what we do with it is what John did. We bring it right to Jesus himself. And we say, Lord, here's my doubt. I'm going to express it to you. And I want you to help me through it. And he will. You can also take that doubt and you can bring it to another fellow Christian that you trust. You could bring it to a pastor. You could bring it to your spouse. You, you could bring it to the scripture and read some great scriptures. You can bring it, you should always bring it to God in prayer and bring it to God. That's what we do with doubt. We don't stuff it down and ignore it and pretend it'll go away. God's not afraid of our doubt. He's, he, he's ha, he has an answer for it and he'll allow you to start to overcome the doubt. Jesus said it this way, Matthew eleven six. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. So here he says, blessed is the, is the person, the Christian who has faith and yes, implied by John is doubt, but doesn't stumble because of me. I don't want you to fall down because of your doubt. I don't want you to stumble. The Greek word here sounds like scandalized. That's literally what the word sounds like in the Greek. It's a fantastic word. I don't want you to be scandalized because of me. I don't want you to fall. I want you to prosper. Don't let your doubt knock you down. Let it build you up. Let it be the very thing that grows your faith. You can't actually have more faith without doubt. That's just true. 
you can't have a faith that's growing without doubt. If you never have any doubt, then then y- your faith can't grow. It's going to stay exactly the same as what it is. Faith grows when we have doubt and we overcome it and we allow God to deal with it. Uh, Scottish minister George MacDonald said it this way, a quote from him, a man may be haunted with doubts and only grow thereby in faith. Doubts are the messengers of the living one to rouse the honest. They are the first knock at our door of things that are not yet, but have to be understood. Doubt must precede every deeper assurance. Notice that last sentence. He says that doubt is actually where faith comes from. Doubt precedes assurance. Doubt precedes more and more faith if we let it and if we let God do his deeper work. And one more quote. This one's from uh, one of my uh, one of the great authors is Flannery O'Connor, and she talks a lot about doubt. And here's what she said. I think there is no suffering greater than what is caused by the doubts of those who want to believe. I know what torment this is, but I can only see it myself anyway as the process by which faith is deepened. So faith uh, through doubt is the way our faith is deepened. A faith that just accepts is a child's faith and all right for children, but eventually you have to grow religiously as every other way, though some never do. What people don't realize is how much religion costs They think faith is a big electric blanket when, of course, it is the cross. That's tough words. That's tough talk. But she's right. She's saying there's a faith that can take you through a childhood version of Christianity. And that's okay. And it'll be good for a while. But ultimately, you want to become an adult in your faith. And it's going to become through those doubts. But the difference is, she's saying, you have the doubts, but you want to believe. I think people are are really destroyed when they have the doubts, but they don't want to believe. They have the doubts and they want to go their own way. That, that of course, is going to lead to, to death. But when we have doubts and we want to believe, God will do what he promised he's going to do, and he'll see us through them and make us stronger and stronger. She says, faith is not like an electric blanket. It's not, this, it's not always this cozy, warm feeling. It's the cross. It's the cross. It's the suffering Messiah. It's Jesus himself. That's what John the Baptist was finding out even while he was in prison, having to watch Jesus do his thing from a distance. But ultimately, um, he, he, he got to see it because he, he ended up in heaven for his faith. And he ended up being able to see what Jesus did and, and being able to, to see his doubts uh, turn into faith, turn into reality. And that'll be the same for each of us who believe and are strong and stay with Christ and don't fall away. And when you have those doubts, you, you bring them right to Jesus and you allow him to help you through them. And I'd like to pray for you right now for, for just that purpose. Lord in heaven, thank you for um, this great passage that's difficult and yet uh, is so helpful and encouraging. Because if John the Baptist could have doubts, then everyone can. And certainly I have had doubts. And yet you have loved me through them every step of the way. You've given me a deeper faith. And I'm sure you'll keep doing that. And for each one here, Lord, listening in to this online service, we pray that you would deepen their faith. Help help the one who needs to take the first step of faith to get over their doubts, to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, to become a Christian. But help the, the vast majority of people that are just somewhere in the middle to take a next step, not to bury the doubts, but to hit them head on, to see what Scripture says, to see what you say, to bring them to Jesus Christ, and that you, Lord, would bring the faith that we need. It's a gift from you. It's not really from ourselves. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And thanks again for being with us. And I want to remind you, we started this week with a brand new podcast. It's called NCC Beyond Sundays. And it's meant to be a follow-up of each of the messages. So starting with this message, Lord willing, is to have on by early Monday morning a podcast that you can easily find on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and subscribe to. It's meant to be 15 minutes or less, but it's meant to take the sermon and bring it beyond Sundays so that by Wednesday, when you've forgotten everything we've talked about today, you're at the gym and you listen to it on your headphones, you've downloaded it, and it's just going to give you a little bit more. Sometimes it'll be a, a, a new truth based on the same text. 
Other times it'll be just an extension. But I hope that it's it's meant to be an encouragement, and I hope that you'll make it a part of your regular regular uh, rhythm of faith uh, as an NCC person, whether you're online or in person. And have an amazing Sunday.